Welcome to Peace Now. My name is Trudy Quaife. I'm a member of Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. We're a local organization of friends and neighbors, and we've been advocating for peace and justice for over a decade. I'm your host today, and I'm joined by Dan Wilcox. Thank you, Trudy. Glad you're here, Dan. So am I. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Dan. He's a longtime peace activist. He's a member of Veterans for Peace. He's a poet and a photographer. So glad you're here. Uh, one thing I'd like to ask you to start out with is, how did you happen to become an activist? Wow, I don't think I ever thought about that. <laughs> um, we know when I went away to college, it was the beginning of the Vietnam War, or at least beginning of the, the uh, activities against the Vietnam War. So it was 1964, and I didn't, I read about these things that were going on over there in the newspapers, and I remember the famous pictures of the monks immolating themselves. I didn't think about it, like in political terms or something, until I went away to college, and uh, there were people there talking about it. And I learned the history of Vietnam through conversations with these people and what was going on. And they had a demonstration, and I'm not sure if this was the first one I went to, but in my mind it is, uh, right on the campus. And there was a priest, on, this was a, at Fordham University in New York, it was mm -hmm. a Jesuit school. Mm -hmm. And there was a priest there who was speaking out um, against the Vietnam War. And so he was being exiled to South America. And uh, they, we had a demonstration, and they, need, they had a petition, a letter, that needed to be brought to, it was outside uh, the, what they call the Provincial House, I think is the name of it, that, that all the Jesuits lived in, and the uh, Jesuit high monkey muck, whatever they call them, was, <laughs> what was in there, and they need someone to bring the letter up. Well, I was only a freshman, I don't mm -hmm. know anything, but I, I volunteered. I said, well, I'll go up, figured I'd just knock on the door, and some old priest came to the door, I handed him the petition, and then I went away. Um, and that, that's my first exposure to that kind of thing. Later on, it occurred to me that the priest that was being exiled to South America must have been Dan Berrigan. Oh. It was right around that time. <laughs> and I don't remember, and I don't know if there's a way for me to, to check historically whether that was actually it, but I think that was Dan Berrigan who was mm -hmm. sent, was being sent away, which of course then he was even more radicalized once he got to South America. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, I don't know I, I guess I was caught up in time, but as I read about it more, I began to see the um, the injustices involved in it and, and how wrong that foreign policy was. Mm -hmm. um, and then around the same time, the civil rights uh, movement was, was uh, really in full steam. And I remember being on a couple uh, marches uh, with, uh, I think we had a, uh, a corps. Congress of Racial Equality mm -hmm. uh, unit on our campus. And I think I walked with them on a couple of their marches. So it was in college and gradual, gradual, gradual got involved. Now you're a veteran. Mm -hmm. And uh, were you drafted during the Vietnam era? I was drafted. I was after, after I finished college. I had my four years and my deferment. And at that time, uh, I finished my classes in January 69. And uh, they'd gotten rid of all the other deferments at that point. You, you couldn't get a deferment just for going to graduate school. So I knew I was going to get drafted. So uh, I wasn't inclined to to go to Canada. Uh, my life was here. And I mm -hmm. said, why should I run away from my country? Um, and I wasn't inclined to go to jail. Uh, and I don't, th I really didn't feel I could be in good conscience, be a conscientious objector. Uh, because uh, at that time I was very, very political, and I thought that I wasn't totally against violence. I mean, if I was attacked, personally attacked, or if the tanks were coming down my street, I figure I would fight back. Mm -hmm. I just didn't think that wars are a way of doing, mm -hmm. of solving things. So I didn't think I would do well in trying to be a conscientious objector and getting alternative service, um, which. Uh, by the way, I, I really admire the people that did that, mm -hmm. that did alternative service. A f poet friend of mine is who did service in Albany Med um, in VA hospital during the Vietnam War, and I really admired him for doing that. And they're not recognized as veterans. Right. See, they don't have any any status at all. That's right. just something I did. And I don't think that's right. 
I think they serve their country as much as I did in my own way. You know. Now, did you protest the war while you were in the military? I was, I, I, I was, you know, anti-war before I went in. I was anti-war while I was in. Um, I didn't uh, go. There weren't any demonstrations or anything I went to, but I had a lot of contacts with other people, mostly uh, political organizations, left-wing political organizations mm -hmm. that were against the war, and who um, people who were in the military, and yet they were part of these organizations. Um, as one of them said to me one time, he says, all good communists should be in the army. He says, and then you learn how to fight. He said. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um, and let, let me clarify too that I was drafted, but I was one of the lucky draftees. Half my training class was sent to Vietnam, and I was in the lucky half, mm -hmm. and I didn't. So I'm a non-combat uh, veteran from the Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. So, w was uh, the organization Veterans for Peace, was, was that organization around during the Vietnam era? No, no. I, I think there was a, a, an organization, and it may have been Veterans Against the Vietnam War mm -hmm. or s something like mm -hmm. that. There was mm -hmm. a Veterans Anti-War Organization, but the current Veterans for Peace that, that exists now mm -hmm. started in, I was going to say 1986, but now I'm beginning to doubt that, and it's either 84 or 86. Okay. Like so it's relatively recent mm -hmm. in that regard. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to talk about Veterans for Peace, but before we move on yeah. from the Vietnam era, do you think that the peace activists really had an effect on that war oh, and, yeah. and ending that war? Oh yeah, I really do. Uh, uh, I think th there's a lot to be learned from that. Um, we didn't stop it right away, mm -hmm. um, but most histories of the anti-war movement and, and the Vietnam War will say that the reason Congress was eventually able to vote uh, to stop funding the war and ending the war, and so then end the war, was because of the people on the streets. Mm -hmm. That the um, when you get millions of people on the streets protesting against the war, the politician has a reason to say, oh, well, my people are against it, and we, and we, we just can't have this. The people don't want it. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why we need public action, uh, visible public action uh, in this country about the war, about health care, about the environment. All of these things are what gives those wimpy politicians the backbone mm -hmm. than to vote for these things. And, th and that's America. That's the, that is the glory of America. And if veterans or soldiers fought for anything, that's what they're fighting for. They're fighting for us citizens to stand on the street corner every Monday, uh, you know, to, to, to rally in front of the Capitol building, um, you know, both in, or here in Albany or in Washington, D.C., where I've been many times. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we need to do. We need to be out there, vocal, at our politicians, but we also need to be on the streets, and that's how people see us. Mm -hmm. Think of the hundreds of people that see us every Monday there in Del Mar. Right. You know, and uh, th those people know why we're there. Yes. But when they go home that night, they turn on the TV, they're not going to see a story about the peace movement. No. But they know one exists because they just saw their neighbor standing on the street corner. Yes. That's so I true. think that's the value of it. Some people will we'll, um, say, well, we're not doing anything any good. No, I don't, I don't believe in that because I believe that even if it's a small group and it's there on a regular basis that uh, you, you're, you're preaching to the people who are too busy to, to stand there with us. Right. Uh, they're taking their kids to soccer. They're mm -hmm. making dinner. They're mm -hmm. going to they take care of their aged mother or father. They're doing the things of life that we all do. They can't stand there on the corner for us. So each one of us who stands there is like, standing here for 10, 20, 30 people. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I agree. We remind people that our country is at war. That's right. That's right. And our people were against the war. Mm -hmm. And we were, yeah. right. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about Veterans for Peace. That's okay. an organization that you're involved in mm -hmm. now. Could you tell us a little bit about Veterans for Peace and, and what they do? Uh, it's a... Uh, I don't know how many members are we have right now. The numbers go up and down. And unfortunately, when there's a, a war like the Iraq War, there are more, more people join it. Mm -hmm. So I think our numbers were uh, way up during the start of the Iraq War. But I don't know what the exact numbers are, are now. 
uh, but there are over 120 chapters throughout the country. Uh, here in New York State, there are, there's a chapter here in Albany. There's one up in Saratoga Springs. Um, there's one down in the Woodstock area. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not all the chapters are meeting regularly um, or even doing events regularly, but they're there. And whenever I travel around the country, I look for two things. I look for poetry readings and I look for peace vigils. Mm -hmm. And I find both. And I can't always get to them. But invariably at the peace vigils, there's someone else from Veterans for Peace there. And it's like being in this club, mm -hmm. you know, and, you, and it's like you belong there. You know, it's like somebody who belongs to a particular church and they go to a strange town, they look for that denomination, they go there and it's like they belong there. You know? mm -hmm. So, uh, the, the well, Veterans of Peace is involved in a n lots of different issues all relating to stopping wars, n not just the current U.S. invasions of Afghanistan and, and uh, in the past of Iraq, but elsewhere in the world. And uh, they, th there's also uh, a big activity now against drones, and that's um, really where the focus is right now on the drones because they're they're trying to sell them to the American people as a as a good way to conduct yes. war, and there's no good way to conduct war. <laughs> you're killing people, and in fact, you're killing civilians more than you're killing quote unquote soldiers. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I think they've tried to sell Americans on the idea. Well, at least with drones, they our own military personnel isn't being killed. Right. But, but in fact, it's the history of uh, the 20th century. We're now in the 21st century. The history of the 20th century is going from soldiers fighting soldiers. Think of World War One and the, the trench warfare. So soldiers were shooting at warfare at each other, uh, and there were some cities that were were bombed, and there was some bombing of civilian centers, but mostly it was soldiers killing soldiers. And then you have World War II, and then there's a lot of bombing of cities and, and destroying of cities. And notably at the end of the war, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which were all civilians. They weren't even military targets. There were, mm -hmm. you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of civilians were wiped out uh, immediately. Uh, and then subsequent to that, think of the wars that the United States has been involved in. You know, uh, when the United States invaded um, Iraq, we were bombing Baghdad. What were, we, what were we bombing? We were bombing hospitals, schools, people's houses, you know. Uh, so the victims are the civilians. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that drones are almost the epitome of that because uh, they go after one bad guy and they kill six or seven other people who are around them who are civilians and maybe they're related to them, maybe they're not, but that, you know, you kill someone's family if you're going after a bad guy. I don't think that's not the America that I love. I agree. Uh, I agree. I um, I was thinking about a recent protest that I know you were at. I saw you there. Mm -hmm. um, is the uh, there was a build up to a bombing of Syria. Yeah. And in the end, uh, there was no bombing that's of right. Syria. That's right. And um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think prevented that from happening? I think one of the things we don't do well in the peace movement is take credit for our successes. You know, we, people often speak of doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not going to be doing this, spending my lifetime and my energy doing this if I don't have some hope that I'm going to have some success. Now, mm -hmm. maybe I can't abolish all the wars tomorrow morning, mm -hmm. all right? But, but if through our actions we can stop little things here and there, then we should be proud of that. And Syria is a great example. Mm -hmm. As soon as President Obama announced that he wanted, he was considering military strikes against Syria, people started calling the White House. Mm -hmm. He backed off real quick, bounced it to Congress. Congress was inundated with phone calls. In fact, I was on my way to the vigil in Delmar uh, one Monday, and NPR was reporting on the news. It was the first time I've ever heard this in my life. NPR was reporting on the news that Congress was being inundated with calls against a military strike on Syria. Now, when have you ever heard that? And that's the peace movement. That's so. people and and drawing people in who are not normally uh, peaceniks or whatever, picking up the phone and calling the members of Congress and calling the president. And that's we should take credit for that. 
-hmm. You know, that's something as people say, what are you doing? Well, we stopped the war on Syria. We did. Yeah. I think we have to give ourselves credit yeah. for making a difference. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Two of the events that you do almost every year that I always appreciate. One is where you do the uh, reading of uh, John Hershey's book, uh, right. Hiroshima, mm -hmm. which I think is so powerful. I think there's a whole generation of people that haven't, don't hardly know what that even is all about. Right. So I think when you read that book in a park, I think yeah. that really makes a difference. And then the other event that I really appreciate is that every year you organize the Veterans for Peace contingent in the Veterans Day Parade in Albany. Right. Well, and the Memorial Day Parade. And the Memorial we, Day we Parade. We march in both of those parades. And uh, that's something I, uh, I'm i very proud of, that, that we were able to do this. We, it, we, we asked the city of Albany uh, at the time of the Kosovo thing, I think it was. So how long ago was that? Almost 20 years ago? Or maybe? Uh, I don't know what yeah. it is. Whatever it is. Um, at, that t at that point, it was a, and it was Veterans Day Parade, um, I decided we're going to call up the city and ask if we could be in the parade. And I had a backup plan. We're called Veterans for Peace. We want to be in the Veterans Day Parade. And if they said no, my next phone call was going to be to the newspapers. I thought this would be a great story. Well, I didn't have to call the newspaper. Um, those parades are organized by, um, they're under the auspices of the City of Albany, but they're organized by the Tri-County Council of Vietnam Era Veterans. Uh, and it's a more mainstream veterans organization. Um, and to those folks' credits, they b have made us a part of their parades ever since, to the point where I don't even have to call to ask anymore. I get the parade orders automatically, and we're accepted as part of the parade. So I'm very pleased about that. And I think you get such a positive response from the crowd right. as well. Right, right. The crowd, the crowd loves it. Um, and and. The veterans organization really do welcome us in. Mm -hmm. I know maybe there's mm -hmm. a handful of members that maybe feel uncomfortable with us being there, but most of the others, and I've talked to these guys, are glad that we're there and respect us and our work just as we respect them and their mm -hmm. work. Well, good. Time is flying by here, and I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't want to leave this topic, but I would also like to talk a little bit about your poetry. Okay. You're also a poet and a photographer. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the events you do is Third, third Thursday's Night, right. Poetry Night. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. This is an uh, ongoing monthly series at the Social Justice Center in Albany on Central Avenue. It's always on the third Thursday, so you don't even have to know what the schedule is. You just look on your calendar and go one, third two, Thursday. three. Um, and there's always a featured poet. Often it's someone local who's, who's been coming to the open mics, and, or maybe a regional poet. I mean, I've had people from New York City or, the re or somebody passing through. And it's an open mic uh, in addition to the feature, so people who show up can read a poem. And I allow one poem, so that way the night moves along and we're not there forever. And, um, and it's a, it's a way for anybody, anybody, to, to come and read poetry. And it's just for a modest donation. And uh, if we, uh, um, the money goes to support the poets, pay for our featured poet, and also helps the Social Justice Center. Um, do people have to write poetry and then read their own poetry? Or I prefer they if they read their own poetry. Because mm -hmm. if they mm -hmm. read a famous poem, I can go to the library and get that. Right. I can get it online. So you'd rather they read I'd their rather own. hear that, read a person's mm -hmm. own work. And open mics are, are a way for people to try out their poetry. So if mm -hmm. they're not used to reading in public, just try it out, mm -hmm. even if you don't think it's very good. Who cares? How many people would go to a typical meeting? Oh, it depends. Mm -hmm. Depends on factors. I don't even know what the factors okay. are. I've had that room so filled you couldn't move. Uh, and uh, maybe on an average, say, 10, 12, 15 people. There's a certain hardcore mm -hmm. number of poets who show mm -hmm. up and like coming every month. Um, and we get occasional people wandering in. There's always somebody new, though. It mm -hmm. always seems like there's somebody new. Mm -hmm. And people can come and just listen, too. They don't have to read. They can just come and enjoy the poetry. Now, do you find any overlap between poets and activists? Do you sometimes have activists <laughs> at your poetry readings? And there's a lot of activists. At the, there's a lot. There's, there's a, um, it's interesting. I really don't find too many um, uh, pro-war, right-wing um, 
poets like that. It, it, I was going to say angry too, but uh, you can be an angry uh, left-wing anti-war poet too, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's interesting. Most of the people, if people read political poems, they're usually about environmental issues. They're anti-war poems. They're, they're about everyone should have health care, about the, about the um, corporate America and all that. So uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. We don't have too many of the, the right-wing poets. Hmm. Well, when I was getting ready f for today's interview, I remembered that I had a book that I mm -hmm. had some of your poems in, mm -hmm. and so I brought that, and it's a it's a post post, post traumatic, traumatic press press yeah. from two thousand seven, yeah. and, and uh, I know there's some very powerful poems in there, yeah. and I'm hoping maybe that you'll read a couple of your poems All for right. us. All right. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, I think there? we have seven or eight minutes. Okay. All right. I'll tell you what. I'll do two poems then. Um, by the way, that book uh, is uh, edited by another um, Veterans for Peace friend. He's a, he, is, uh, he did serve in Vietnam. He was wounded over there. Uh, Dale Weiss out of mm -hmm. uh, Woodstock. Mm -hmm. And he publishes lots of other poems. Mm -hmm. It's a great book. I'm Thank you. really glad to have it oh. in my collection. Oh, good. I'll tell him. I'll tell okay. him when I see him. I'll, I'll read uh, a poem that's not in that book, but it's in um, a number of other collections of poetry I've done. And uh, this is about Oil War I. Okay. <laughs> 1991 it was, I guess, uh, when the first George Bush uh, invaded uh, Iraq for the first time. I went down to Washington on the bus, and we, everyone before the demonstration was going to the Vietnam Memorial. So that's what this is about. It's called Peace Marchers at the Vietnam Memorial. Who would have thought on that cold December in 1969 when we met? my boots and I, that we'd be here in Washington on my birthday, marching against still another war. We did not think then we would stand here, older now, more worn, creased, gray showing at the fray, among other peace marchers who leave their signs on the lawn to stand before this litany of stone. 58,000 points of light etched into the blackness and now gone out not even a flicker. Unless you count those here now, those who remember, who tell their children, Vietnam, Cambodia, Kent State, Jackson State, who hug each other, who cry, who lean against the wall, find names we have not forgotten, some never even known in the worn soul of memory. When we low crawled through that night assault exercise, we did not imagine this pilgrimage along the dusty stones of the mall, and still another grim age like when those on the wall died. It just goes on and on, from a jungle of politics to a desert of values. Kuwait, Tel Aviv, Baghdad, Kafji. Who would have thought, when I applied those acres of black polish, I would be here to say no again? Like that birthday when I sat in the latrine and cried for loneliness. I don't want to have to do this. I want to go home and celebrate my birthday. We came here to wage war on war. Vermont, Albany, Boston, New York. To the wall, to weep, to stare, to murmur. Hushed as if the dead were here. As indeed they are in us, in this great crowd that even all of them could be lost in. Who would have thought, who would have thought, at least we, my boots and I, can still march. And when they're gone, I'll buy new boots, and boots for my children, and keep on marching. Powerful, Dan. That was really Thank good. You. Thank you. Well, that's what we need to do. We need to get the younger generation to march with us behind us and then pick up after we mm -hmm. can't march anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think your poems are, are one way to really uh, to pass on information to the younger mm -hmm. generation about what it feels like and mm -hmm. what war is about. And I Well, that's what art does, see, all yeah, art, not just yeah, poetry. Yeah. That's what art does. It takes some individual's private emotion and then puts it out there and then people realize, oh, I, I know that feeling. I've had that feeling. So mm -hmm. that's what art does: is transfers his, these emotions from one person to another, mm -hmm. and 
if you you pick up a poem or you look at a painting or you listen to some music and you are moved by it, then the artist was a success. You know. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing a picture of you reading poetry in front of the Capitol in Washington. <laughs> it was at the Split Rock. Split this Rock Poetry Festival. Yeah, that's. Oh. Uh, I just came back from that. It was again this year. It's held every two years in Washington D.C. It's a wonderful experience. It's a poetry festival, but it combines poetry and activism. So the workshops are often on political topics. Um, involving poetry in one way or another. So mm -hmm. I, I'm a big supporter of it. Anyone can look it up on the internet, splitthisrock.org, mm -hmm. and uh, you get all the information about it. Okay. Well, we just have a couple minutes left, so maybe you would want to read one more of your I have a, shorter poems. I have a short one that's in that book, okay. I think, that you're referring to. Okay. That is probably a good way to come to an end. Um, Sounds good. This is called, If Peace Broke Out Tomorrow. If peace broke out tomorrow in this city, across our country, throughout the world, would you be ready? If peace broke out tomorrow, would you be prepared, like they say we must be prepared for war? Would you be able to love the Huns, the Japs, the Gooks, the Ragheads? If peace broke out tomorrow, would you believe in peace as you believe in the axis of evil, the weapons of mass destruction? If peace broke out tomorrow, would you willingly send tax dollars for schools and hospitals instead of for bombers and aircraft carriers? Would you heed the call from the Department of Peace for volunteers, for peacemakers, to beat swords into plows? If peace broke out tomorrow like a flock of white doves, dropping olive branches on everyone. Would you be ready? Would you enlist? I love that poem. <laughs> Thank That's you. That's just great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're just about out of time, so uh, could you just tell people how they could get in touch with Veterans for Peace? Say there's Simple. a veteran out there that would like to join. Very easy. Veteransforpeace.org is a website. Veteransforpeace, all one word, dot org. Okay. And how about uh, Third Thursdays? Third Thursdays, uh, go to, come down to the Social Justice Center in Normandy on the third Thursday at 7.30, um, and we'll be there. Okay, great. Well, this has been such a pleasure, and I hope you'll come back okay. in the future and read some more of your poems. Okay, and thank you. We'll Trish. talk more. Yeah, I will. Thank you all for joining us today, and please join us again for future episodes where we'll be talking about the cost of war in terms of our local and national economies. And we'll also be talking more about drones and hydrofracking and the uh, criminal injustice system, as some people have called it. Thank you. Bring them home, bring them home. Kettles of Baghdad back to our arms, bring them home.